Welcome everyone to today's event on why is shaping the public sector key to a better world. Before we get started, let's review a few housekeeping items. All attendees have been muted to minimize background noise. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of the screen. We're going to have a designated time at the end of the panel discussion to answer questions. So please type in your questions uh, as, you, as you have them. Uh, you needn't wait until later on. Please make sure to include your full name and your organizational affiliation. We are recording today's session and a video and audio recording will be made available on the IGC's website. I'd also like to point out that there'll be a brief survey immediately following today's presentation. So please do take a minute to fill that out. Your feedback is really helpful to us in terms of making future effects, future events as effective as possible. Please feel free also to contribute to our conversation online by using hashtag ideas matter IGC. Let me say a few words about why the IGC is convening this discussion today. Towards the end of 2019, the IGC celebrated its 10th anniversary by reflecting back on its key contributions to development economics and to policy and looking forward to the challenges of the next 10 years. A few weeks ago, we launched the Little Book of Growth Ideas, which is a short compilation of just some of the ideas that we've helped to contribute over the past decade and have made a policy, a positive impact to policy making in the countries where IGC is present. There's a, will be a link in the chat uh, to that uh, book if you're interested. It's available on the IGC website and a good example of how good ideas mixing rigorous research and uh, engagement with policymaker, with policymakers can help find solutions to challenges facing developing countries. You may also want to read an IGC growth brief, a growth brief on information and innovation in the public sector. A link to that will be posted as well. The effectiveness of government is increasingly seen as a key driver of economic growth and development. But effective public services requires effective public servants. Today we discuss the policy implications of two of the ideas in our book that explore the impact of incentivizing civil servants to design and deliver effective public services. I'll be putting a question or two to each of our speakers before we move on to general discussion and offer you a chance to ask your own questions. Let me now welcome our expert panelists who are here to help us uh, address this challenging topic. Oriana Bandiera is a professor of economics here at the LSC and holds the Sir Anthony Atkinson, Atkinson Chair in Economics. Nana Kwesi Ajakum Dwamena is the head of the civil service in Ghana. Martin J. Williams is an associate professor at the, in public management at the Bravatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Let me start by turning to Martin. Martin, as I said, is at the Bravatnik School of Government and a research fellow at the Green Templeton College. His research is on management, policy implementation, and political economy mostly focused on Africa. Management and productivity are crucial to public service delivery in African countries where governments have to deliver services with limited resources. Yet reforms are often launched with little data about the current state of management and productivity. Martin, in an IGC project that you undertook with Imran Razul and Dan Rogger, you surveyed nearly 3,000 civil servants and assessed over 3,600 projects across every ministry and department in governments in Ghana's central government to study the link between management and productivity in the public sector. What are the key findings of your study of the Ghanaian civil service? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I think it's important to, you know, before I say actually what the, what the actual findings were, the reason why we did this survey in the first place um, was because of conversations that came out of um, interaction that, um, that I had had with Nana, um, who had just become head of civil service. And I had done some previous research working with um, the government of Ghana that Nana was aware of. And, you know, Nana came in with this drive to, to say, how can we take a data-driven approach to improving the performance of the civil service and changing the way that things work for the better? Um, 
And so, you know, the, this idea of doing a big sort of diagnostic survey to assess the state of management and performance on the survey was actually um, Nana's idea originally. Um, and, you know, myself and Dan and Imran then sort of scrambled to say, okay, how can we actually do this in a way that, um, that, that is useful? Um, and the, the implementation of the survey, the design of it, all those things were done really, really collaboratively with um, Nana and his team at the Office of the Head of Civil Service. The actual enumeration of the survey was done by um, civil servants who were, uh, you know, from the, from the Ghana Civil Service and who we worked with as a research team um, to kind of ensure that the, the actual process of the research was also something that was collaborative. Uh, the, there were kind of two key findings that emerged from that research. The first one was that, um, you know, there's often this perception that people have both within Ghana and in the civil service and also outside, um, uh, you know, people who are outsiders to a country that, oh, the civil service, it's, you know, it's, it's one, it's one whole, whole mess, like nothing works. Um, and it's all, you know, it's all just inefficiency and corruption and so on. Um, and that wasn't my experience. That wasn't the experience of a lot of people working in the civil service in Ghana. And sure enough, when we did the survey, that's what we found. So we found a lot of variation across organizations in the approaches that were taken to, to, to management and getting things done on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, you could even see on a given practice that was supposed to be standardized across organizations like how annual appraisals are done and how performance information is, feed, is fed back to individuals, you know, it's the exact same template of paper, which is used in all different ministries, but the way that that got used was very, very different. So some ministries, it was actually used to um, guide what workers did on a day-to-day -day basis and give feedback to them and, uh, and sort of meaningfully assess their performance at the end of the year. In other ministries, it was something that, you know, someone filled out without even discussing with their boss and just got signed off and it went into a folder somewhere. And we saw this also, this variation wasn't just that like individual practices were done differently, but when we looked at the kind of quality of management or the level of performance of entire organizations, we saw variations that there were some organizations that, you know, really were pretty poorly managed and um, of the tasks that they had set themselves out to do for the year, they hardly completed anything. And then there were other organizations that um, were, you know, uh, they they took up they had appropriate management procedures that were actually followed and had supporting uh, kind of informal practices that were used um, to to make those procedures meaningful and uh, and then there were organizations in the middle right where they did some things well and some things poorly they were just kind of average which is you know in some senses what we might expect and I think what a lot of us have experienced in our own uh, organizations and interactions with government but wasn't something that was really that present in the literature. The second key finding of what we found from that survey was that um, there's this perception often that what's wrong with civil services is that there needs to be more incentives and more of a kind of carrot and stick approach to uh, getting things done. Um, and what we actually found was that when we looked at the relationship between management practices and task completion, we actually found that there was a really positive association between practices that were related to giving civil servants autonomy and discretion and empowering them to actually use it and task completion. But once, you know, conditional on that, we actually found a negative relationship between practices related to monitoring and incentives. So that kind of top down carrot and stick approach and task completion, um, which, you know, to, to us, what that said is, uh, okay, there, there are questions about you know, what is cause and effect and are there other factors here? But this is at least suggested evidence that um, civil servants are, you know, professionals and professionals all else equal want to do their job well. And when you give them the autonomy and actually the information they need to be able to do that, that they use it to get things done. I think you're on mute, Jonathan. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, really, really interesting. I wonder if, if we could uh, take a sort of step back and uh, in, in, in think a little bit about the process, uh, you know, with, in terms of your engagement with the, the government and particularly with the head of the civil service. Reflecting on that collaboration, I wonder if you could say something about what, in your view, makes collaborations between researchers and policymakers successful. Yeah, well, I think there are kind of two key tensions that often um, 
often research academic research projects that work with government struggle to reconcile. And the first one is, you know, there are questions that are of interest to academics because they're related to academic literatures or some kind of theory that we're interested in. Um, and then there's questions that are of interest to policymakers, which are, you know, often much more practical and kind of immediate and like, what should I do as, a pro as opposed to how does the world work? Um, and, and I think the second tension then is, is kind of related, but it's a little bit different. And it's the tension between what are the questions and the information that's interesting to people who are working in the context where the research is being done versus what is interesting to people from outside that context? Because um, obviously, you know, the collaboration, the research that we do is to help the government of Ghana, um, but it's also to help all of the other governments around the world because um, they can also learn something from that experience. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't think that there's a magic um, solution to reconciling those two tensions the right way that works in every case. But I think understanding that those are there and being kind of transparent about them and making sure that um, all of the parties involved are communicating about, you know, this is why we think this is important. This is why we think this is important. Um, here's how we can reconcile those. Uh, here's how, can, here, how we can kind of balance uh, what each, each stakeholder is getting out of the research project. Um, I think the other thing is that, you know, academics, we're often, um, we often take our interests and our questions from other academics and from academic research. And I'm a big believer that if you can find a question, which um, is something that people who are working in that context, who are really the experts in that context, uh, don't understand about their own context, that like if you can identify that question, that's almost always going to be of interest to other academics and other researchers and people all around the world. And so taking your inspiration from like, what are the actual practical problems on the ground, uh, I think is very important. And then the final thing I'd say is that, um, you know, in sometimes in writing up the results of these research and in analyzing it, uh, we, we struggle because we try and write papers which are all things to all people. Um, right, that we say, I want this to be policy relevant and respond to these, um, these immediate policy questions. And I want it to be a brilliant deep piece uh, with all these theoretical insights. And you can get both of those things out of the same research project. But I think sometimes it's best just to recognize that, you know, sometimes you should just write two different outputs for different audiences that might be different lengths and use different languages and address different questions and provide different types of evidence. Um, and you know those things are not inconsistent with each other. It's just different facets of the same project. Uh, but you know sometimes having different uh, different outputs for different audiences can be a way to help reconcile those tensions. Thanks, uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, I think that's really really insightful. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Nana Kwesi Ajikum Dronena, who, as I said at the outset, is the head of the civil service in Ghana. His career as a civil servant spans a period of 26 years. In 1995, he was posted to the office of the head of the civil service where he worked as head of the reform coordinating unit. He was then appointed the director of the performance management uh, division in 2005, and then became head of the civil service in 2014. Nana, I wonder if you could, building on, on Martin's, uh, or potentially diverging from Martin's observations, if you could tell us a bit about how the findings from these two large-scale surveys in 2015 and 2018 across the civil service have been used by you and your colleagues to inform policy, and in particular, what policies and initiatives have already been implemented as a result? Um, thank you, Jonathan, and Good afternoon to all colleagues. It's good to see uh, Martin again, and, and, and I'm glad to be part of this. Here's a minor point. Uh, you know, I've been working in the government of Ghana since 1988, because I'm looking forward to retiring next year. So th that'll be uh, over 32 years. So, so basically, it's not 26. OK, um, very good. That, that's just on, on. I know you got that information from the website, which should be corrected. Uh, but that's just on the side. Uh, um, coming specifically to the issue of um, the nature has been of collaboration, what benefits? How, how would we use this uh, um, output of the research? Let, I, I, let me agree uh, to, to begin with, with Martin, that we, we really demanded, requested for the various surveys to be undertaken. 
of course, based on previous activity. So as far as that is concerned, we, 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 we are on the same uh, page. We, we requested for it. And actually, our team in Ghana worked hard with Martin and Imran and the rest to design this, this, this program. And, and as Riley said, we interviewed about 3,000 uh, um, um, civil servants, uh, basically. On, on issues of management, on performance management, uh, training, the benefits of training, and how we could improve uh, training service delivery and stuff like that. So um, it was a broad range uh, of, of issues that we're looking at. Now, if you want to ask Pascal what benefits we have had, uh, um, as recent as 2018, I mean, when the results came out in 2019, before I come to specific policy strategies, because of the approach that we took where ministries were interviewed and as part of our process of feeding back, we went to the various ministries, had presentations, various presentations to them and explained. So if you take Minister of, let's say, Works and Housing or Minister of Finance, what were the key findings specific to that ministry? We do a general presentation and they will do specific findings to that ministry. And, and these things are done not just to the technical class, more often than not, we had the ministers present. And, and, and I remember one particular ministry, the minister said, Nana, that's true, this research has really confirmed what I've been worried all along. So what is the way forward? And so we said that, look, the way forward is for you. These are the findings, and these are the things that are being proposed. You take the steps and correct it. I think Ministry did um, with those in the uh, as well as 2018 findings uh, and what changes have taken place. We've not really started documenting. In terms of the broad strategy of what has changed, one of the key things is our performance management frameworks documents are about to be revised completely. Uh, uh, and we, we have a system for assessing our chief directors. Uh, for those of you in the Commonwealth, it's like the equivalent of the permanent secretaries and our directors, principal secretaries. As a result of this research, we got a few new ideas as to what people wanted to do. And so it led to a complete review. One of the key things is also the way training is organized by our civil service training center. People preferred working to the from the various departments because the research are clearly stated that when they come to the training center, we train. And everybody. So that for those were the two major uh, changes. Of course, uh, we have other things that have happened. Let's just see. Let's wait a minute and see if we can get Nana back. He's he's had to take this um, uh, call from uh, another office, not his own, so he doesn't have the same uh, connection that he normally would have. Hello. Oh, yeah. have... yep. I can hear you now. We can't see you, but I can hear you. Um, video is on. Mm -hmm. A problem of having to work from somebody's office. Hmm. Are you? Can you hear me now? We can. So why don't you go ahead? Because the audio. Yeah, team... let me just call. Yes. Okay. That that's fine. So I was saying uh, one of the key outputs of the joint, uh, the collaborative effort was the training of over forty nine civil servants in research methodologies. These have been deployed in the various civil service departments and trying to build the capacity of the research directorate. And these were the same servers that were used in the 2018 uh, thing. Indeed, two of the researchers have been recruited at the Office of the Head of Civil Service uh, to beef up and to help build the capacity for research in, in an hour. These are all unintended consequences of the 
of the of the or benefit byproducts of the research. So yes, it's been a useful collaborative thing. For me, the principal thing is I think that public servants should take control of the research. It's not what the researchers want to look at. In terms of we producing their report, so be it. There's no problem. But we must take control and be clear in our minds what we want to achieve, the products we want to get. And then we can then use that to improve our systems, our service delivery, our, pro our approaches. I wonder, just building on that point, Nana, thanks very much. It was really uh, interesting to hear uh, how that fed through on your side and, and some of the sort of very concrete changes. And, and it's very clear that there's a, that the program was completely owned uh, by you and, and your colleagues in government, which seems clearly to be important. I wonder if you had to give um, a list of sort of priorities for researchers who are um, interested in and, and uh, interacting with you, you and your colleagues. So a kind of to-do list of how they can make, they can help build a, a productive collaboration with you in government. What would be on that list? So what, what do you think are the things that are most important for researchers to keep in mind in terms of building an effective collaboration with policymakers such as yourself? Ooh. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Uh, uh, let me make this point. Um, I think to-do list is, is, for me, it's a difficult thing. Not because we don't have uh, uh, things that areas I want to research, but I think it should be specific to each country and or each organization, depending on what they set out to do. I think before you do anything about uh, uh, to-do list, the question is, where do you want to go as an organization, that is very, very important. I came to the office from management services with the idea of just bringing about reforms. So I have very specific things. My area was in the area of performance management, was in the area of what do we deal with remuneration or recognition schemes, non-financial remuneration, and how do we improve monitoring and evaluation. So there are standard templates there of what can we do differently. Uh, and so these are the areas. For example, start, um, uh, research on uh, of management of public service and uh, what is quite different. Uh, one of the uh, points that I found very funny is that uh, we introduced a uh, physical. No, no, I'm afraid we're not, the video, the audio quality is too poor. We're not able to understand uh, that point. Uh, could we just test the quality, quality right now? Could Hello? Yep. Okay. But yep. It seems to come and go. Okay. Now we can see you. The audio quality seems to come and go. We, would, we didn't uh, get a clear signal just a minute ago. Perhaps if you could just quickly now just summarize the, the key points you were making, because um, it seems to be good right now, the connection. Okay. The, the point I was making is one, it depends on the nature of the organization. Where do they want to go and what they have in mind? But we set out clearly that I wanted to look at how to improve performance management systems, how to have remuneration or recognition schemes that is not financial based, and how to improve the monitoring of the Office of the Head of Social Services as a central management agency. Not to go there as supervisor, but to be more facilitators and helpers. So it is on these principles that we develop the various uh, teams for our research. So I, I will not go into the area of saying, which areas do you want to go? But I rather suggest people take the lead, organize and decide what one that will fit. But if you want specifically in Ghana, Silver so says now, which areas do we want to go? We want to look at um, one of the major things, every, every four, almost every four years, there's a change in, in, in ministerial structures. We get a raft of organizations being created. And we, we want to look at what has been the implication, the cost implication of such changes every four years. That is one major area that we want to look at. Another area is, is uh, the area of changes in governance, uh, leadership, uh, councils and boards. Four years, we have complete change in governing boards and councils. People with expertise go, goes off, they go off. And at times these organizations remain virtually inactive for almost six, seven months. 
which has implications for the various government organizations. It's an area that I want to do so that we can change the way um, the political and administrative interface uh, goes in our system. So these are areas of, for research in Ghana. Thanks very much. I think that's a um, really, really important point. And just, just briefly to summarize, I think this idea of really the need to understand better the interface, as you were saying, between the political and the administrative side, but also how to manage the electoral cycle. So how, yeah. how to manage the fact that each government understandably wants to bring in uh, new initiatives, new appointments and so forth. And how can that be managed uh, to minimize the impact on the effectiveness of government you know, yeah. over, over time? That's true. That's true. Yeah. So thank, thank you very much. Um, let me turn now to uh, Oriana Bandiera. Um, Oriana is a is colleague of mine in the economics department and she wears very many hats, so I won't cover all of them, but uh, apart from being a professor uh, and having the, uh, the Anthony Atkinson chair. Um, she also is a research program chair and steering group member for the IGC. Um, she is the chair of Stickard, which is another research center at the LSE, and she leads a number of, of exciting large-scale research projects at the same time. Not sure how she does it. Um, Oriana, you've worked with the Ministry of Labor in Zambia on a study of civil service productivity, particularly building on um, the, the fact that in 2013 there was a, a significant salary increase across the board for civil servants. And I wonder if, if you could talk about sort of two things. One, building directly on that survey, which is what were the main takeaways for policymakers that came out of that? And then the other is public sector employees are often described as inefficient or even corrupt. And I wonder if you could say something about whether the data support that view, uh, but then also about more broadly, what can we do to recruit, to motivate and retain effective workers? Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to share some slides with you because I find it hard to talk without figures. And the first figure is the first thing that we discussed when we started the IGC program in um, state organization. And that is a very simple fact that we tend to forget, which is that the state is made of people. We always think of infrastructure projects, taxation, schooling and whatnot, but fundamentally the heart of the state are people. And if you look at the share of employee compensation in public spending, that's very large everywhere. And the poorer the country, the larger that share. So it is key that we get these people right. Now, I think we are as far from that as is humanly possible. If this were in person, I would ask the audience to give me the first word that comes to their mind when I say civil servant or bureaucrat. I haven't figured out how to do it on Zoom yet, so I'll give you the answer that I get on a typical talk. So this is what I normally get. Corruption, inefficient, slow, incompetent, waiting, mediocre, ineffective, lazy. You can pick your favorite offensive term. Now, this is obviously a problem because if the state is made of people and the people that make the state are of this type, we are not in a good place. So our research looks at, so the, the, C, uh, sorry, the AGC research on state organization looks at how to hire the right people, how to monitor and motivate them on the job and how to retain them. And I'm gonna give you um, two pieces of evidence that speak to two commonly held views. The first is that bureaucrats tend to be corrupt and must be monitored very closely. This is what both Martin and Nana mentioned. Okay, we can't trust the bureaucrats. And the second, which is even more pernicious, I think, is that frontline workers like teachers or nurses or doctors, we have to be careful with paying them a lot because if we do, we'll end up attracting the wrong people the people who do it for the money instead of for the good of the state. Now, I have two pieces of uh, evidence that speak to do these two questions, and they're both AGC projects, so you'd be happy to know. Um, the first one is in Pakistan, done in collaboration with the procurement agency in Punjab, Pakistan, and is with uh, Michael Best, Amdan Khan, and Andrea Pratt. And the second is done with the ministry in Zambia, as you were mentioned earlier. So they speak to these two points. The first study 
what we did was something quite adventurous, shall we say. In Pakistan, procurement officers are monitored very closely by another person, which is the accountant general. The accountant general makes sure that the filling of the form, that the stamps of the stamps, that they sign all the signature that I need to be signed. Now, we removed this. We made the procurement officers autonomous. Some of them, experimentally, were given autonomy. Some were given incentives. And others were left as a control. And this is what happened. This is autonomy. This is the combined effect of autonomy and incentive, and this is incentive alone. Incentive reduce the prices that they got for procurement for exactly the same goods. I don't have the time to explain you how we did that, but trust me, these were exactly the same goods. Incentives decrease prices by 3%, autonomy by 9%. Now, this is a big saving because incentives cost money. You have to pay the bonuses. Autonomy is completely free. Actually, if you take into account that you can fire the monitor, this actually comes at an additional gain. The nurses in Zambia was a different question. We wanted to address the question of what happens if you give material rewards to people who are supposed to serve the country out of the good of the heart. And so we allocated different districts randomly to different treatments when recruiting nurses for rural areas. A bunch of districts got a typical be good, be a nurse type of ad, and another bunch of districts got a more career-oriented type of ad. And everybody guesses, again, when I ask people to guess, that the be good, be pro-social type of ad attracted better applicants. But actually, it was the other way around. The career ad attracted more talented applicants who worked harder, did more visits, which resulted in people using health facilities more, which resulted in better health. So where does this leave us? Eventually, it will leave us somewhere. There you go. There is this widespread belief that state bureaucracies are corrupt and inefficient. And this is damaging in several ways. Because the policies that are meant to curtail corruption actually create massive level of inefficiency. And low pay and flat career paths fail to attract talent. So the belief is self-fulfilling. The state bureaucracy is slow, but that's because the policies that we put in place to prevent it from being corrupt make it so. And I think that as externalities from growth, well, pandemics, as we painfully know, and climate change, which still goes on, as these things loom large, the coordination between private actors becomes essential. And only the state can achieve that. So we must turn around the state, starting from the belief that we can have an efficient and effective state the same way we can have an efficient and effective firm. Thanks very much, Oriana. Let's uh, take the opportunity now with, with uh, your, your um, insights uh, as well as Nana's and Martin's to broaden out to a, a panel discussion and then I'd like to open out to questions from the audience. Um, so first, I wonder, uh, Nana, if I could ask you, um, what actions have you taken in Ghana, uh, so both you personally but colleagues in government as well, to ensure the effective uh, and transparent use of public resources during this crisis period. I think one of the things that uh, has been uh, so clearly evident over the past uh, seven, eight months has been how the pandemic has highlighted the need for strong and effective government uh, because governments are inescapably at the center of the crisis response. And I think it's really important to understand what what we've learned from this so far. So what are the biggest 
limitations we've seen in the response to the pandemic and how might those those limitations be addressed and so none in that context i wonder if you could just say something briefly about the in ghana what measures have been taken in terms of increasing the effective and transparent use of public resources during this crisis period Okay, none. Since none is not connected right now, let's let's shift. Let me put that same question, but removing Ghana from the uh, from the question. That is for Martin and uh, Oriana. I wonder, in general, what do you think governments can be doing to strengthen the transparency and accountability uh, uh, as part of their crisis response? Martin, can I come first to you? Yeah, um, I guess I I would. I would slightly reframe the question. I think that transparency and accountability are very important, but I also think that they're not synonymous with effectiveness. Um, and you know, when, when we talk about government, we often have this kind of tendency to assume that all these good things go together. Um, and you know, I think as, as some of the evidence that I talked about and Oriana talked about, actually what's, can, what can be really important in, uh, in effectiveness of, of civil services is ensuring that bureaucrats have the autonomy and the discretion to be able to actually um, to not not just make the right choices in a given situation but try and come up with their own ideas and shape the and shape policy agendas obviously everything um, you know uh, civil servants don't go out and do things on their own, right? There is, needs to be discussions with policymakers. But if you look at, for example, the UK and the furlough scheme, um, you know, that was actually an initiative that was uh, spearheaded by civil servants and it got, and it got political buy-in. Um, but the reason why that happened so quickly and efficiently in the UK, uh, even in this moment of crisis, was because civil servants had that autonomy. Um, they had networks, they had been able to work with each other and uh, there was still space in the culture for people to come up with their own ideas and work on them. And yes, eventually get approval and it was all done trans, you know, transparently and accountability and that kind of thing. Well, anyway, there's, uh, there's, there's new stories that you can read if you want to learn more about the, the specifics of the, the furlough scheme. But um, for, you know, I think for something that was implemented at quite high financial cost during a crisis, it's been really effective and really well administered. And as Oriana highlighted, you know, there's also costs to, um, to, to removing that kind of space, not just that civil servants can't come up with those kind of initiatives, but that things can get paralyzed, people don't talk to each other. You know, you can imagine that if the UK government had had a, um, a really sort of stringent and top-down uh, incentive scheme for, pe for people who run organizations that, coordination might have been much worse uh, among organizations than it was. Um, and so I think these are some of the things that, you know, as, as researchers, but also policymakers, there are so many different dimensions to government performance and to this broader concept of effectiveness that we have. Um, and I, I think being slightly more nuanced and precise about what we mean could be really useful. Thanks. So, Oriana, the same, same question to you, and maybe, maybe phrasing it more broadly in terms of using the crisis response, which has not only highlighted the role of government, but obviously taken government into new areas uh, of activity and expanded the government role. What sort of things um, have we learned so far in terms of what makes such responses effective? I think I have to agree with Martin, is the people. We have to give more freedom, more autonomy, there is now mounting proof because we take it from service and we say, well, it's not causal. There is an experiment, now it's causal. So I think there is no doubt that we need to give people more trust. And that will have an immediate impact on the existing civil servants. And it will you know, immediately be noticed by the population. So it's accountability and transparency, but if they don't have the means to do a good job, seeing them doing a bad job is not gonna help anyone. So I think giving them, giving bureaucrats and civil servants the, the autonomy to do things and also higher pay because their job becomes ever more important. So we want to hire people for working for the state who are the best in society 
And you cannot achieve that when the pay in the financial sector is 100 times more. So if you think of financial regulators vis-a-vis -vis the pay of those they're supposed to regulate, it's not, you know, there's not, not even a point to start. So I think that by improving the quality, well, improving the work conditions of the existing civil servants and improving the quality and the talent of the newly recruited civil servants, the policies will become more effective and trust in government will be restored. We see in Zambia, the project that I mentioned earlier, that uh, little girls and boys who are exposed, this is new research that we're doing, who are exposed to effective nurses are more likely to study biology, to take all levels in biology, and more likely to want to become. So talent attracts more talent. So I think it's important to give people a chance to work yeah. and, and then to show what they're doing. Nana, can you hear me? I saw that you were reconnected. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Right. I wonder if you could just say something reflecting on the response to the COVID crisis in Ghana uh, about you know, what uh, actions have been taken by yourself, more broadly by the government, to try to enhance the effectiveness of the response. We've talked a little bit, Martin and Oriana have talked a little bit about some generic things about you know, that come right out of the research about the need for autonomy, the need for high quality civil servants, the need for decent levels of pay and so forth. And I wonder if you could just take us down to the specific case of Ghana and reflecting on the past nine months or so, uh, what you see, what the government has done to enhance its crisis response. And what have been the sort of key features of making the government effective in this challenging context? Uh, looks like we've lost the connection again. In the meantime, let me ask participants, please do uh, begin submitting your questions. We'll be shifting to the broader Q&A uh, in just a few minutes. And so very keen to have your questions for any of the panelists or in just in general questions about things that you'd like to raise. I, as we're waiting, um, Jonathan, one thing that I, uh, I wanted to bring up um, that kind of Oriana's comments sparked was a point that Nana made about, I think, the importance of understanding and improving the political administrative interface within government. So I think, you know, when you look around the world at countries which have responded well to the pandemic, um, they tend to be countries where politicians and civil servants have worked really well together. And there's been enough mutual trust that, um, uh, you know, not only was communication and coordination open and efficient, but also that there was receptiveness to policy ideas uh, and, you know, trust in existing systems and that kind of thing. And I think that's something that we, I say we as, you know, both researchers and kind of policymakers, um, it's something that we don't understand very well, right? Like what are, what are the different forms of um, how you structure those political bureaucratic relationships? What are the costs and benefits of each? Um, are there are there things that can actually be done to improve them? It's kind of you know we, we all have a lot of uh, sort of personal and anecdotal experience of how those how those interactions work under specific administrations or in specific countries. Um, but I think it's something that you know if I, uh, I, I th as priorities potentially for um, IGC or other researchers who are thinking about these questions go. I think that's a really important one. Great, uh, thanks. Well, let me open up now to uh, two questions. Um, we've uh, had, let me give sort of uh, three three questions. We've had one uh, specifically directed at Nano, which I'll hold for the minute. But let me um, say questions that I think at least um, Martin, uh, perhaps in some cases on Ghana, you can reflect on. But uh, both you and Oyana on some more general questions. The first is from uh, Kumar Aniket. He's a research uh, a fellow at UCL and asks, what is the selection process for bureaucrats in Ghana? 
And how does the bureaucracy ensure that capable bureaucrats get promoted? Second uh, question is uh, from Victor, who's in the Ghana Statistical Service. And he says, how do we practice uh, brain circulation in an economy where unemployment is high? Is it the employee who needs to do that or the employer? And that, then let me add just a third question then. And uh, Sheila and Chizo asks, is there any intergenerational change in public sector that we should take into consideration when reforming the public service? So, Oriana, obviously this overlaps a bit with some of the points you were making earlier. So let's take those three uh, questions if we can. Um, the first about the selection process for bureaucrats and promotion in Ghana. And I think perhaps more generally, if either of you want to bring in other examples, um, the second about uh, how do we practice encourage uh, brain circulation in an economy where unemployment is high and what is the role of employees and employers. And then the third is what do we know about intergenerational change in public sectors that, that could be uh, taken into account in public sector. Um, Oriana, do you want to lead off? Okay. Uh, so let me start perhaps with the circulation of ideas. So it's, uh, it's really not an easy question to answer. Uh, I think the main issue is that the poorer the economy, the more misallocation there is. That is, people are doing wrong jobs. Wrong in the sense that some very talented people don't have access to the jobs where their talent would be most valued, and some less talented people take their place. So this role for the government is, and for the state is often forgotten, but I think it's perhaps the most important one. We take it as a given that the markets will allocate resources efficiently, but this hardly ever happens. So there is plenty of room, I think, for jobs programs. Uh, jobs programs that don't need to be necessarily training on a particular skill, but uh, trainings in how to have a broader vision of what constitutes a job. So, you know, the technology and the world are changing. The standard lifetime job where somebody started working in a factory when they were 18 and retired at the age of 65, having been always in the same job, is not there anymore. People have to change jobs and they have to be very malleable. And this malleability is not taught anywhere. So I think there are important, very important roles for the government and the state to come up with programs that help people expand their consideration sets, expand the ideas of what they can do with their skills, and at the same time help firms locate this talent. So in a way, the state can act as a matchmaker, like telling workers where the jobs are and how to be more open-minded as to which type of jobs they can take and helping firms finding the right workers. Because we can let the markets do it, but as we can see, it doesn't work particularly well. You're on mute, Jonathan. Jonathan. Do you want to comment on the intergenerational question about how it's yes. in the public sector? I wasn't quite sure. I can take it to mean two things. The first is that jobs are inherited within the public sector. I don't know if it means that, because in many countries there are there is a very strong correlation between jobs of the parents and jobs of the children, which again is a sign of misallocation because as children we don't necessarily have the same skill set as our parents, and our children won't have the same skill set as ours. Um, so in, you know, in economies where there is very little mobility, so it links very well with the previous question, um, you tend to have these dynasties of doctors, dynasties of civil servants, and so on. Um, so this is pretty much the answer, the same as the question before. Um, I don't know how else to interpret the question. Do you, do you think in that? So, so my, my interpretation, which um, I could that well be wrong about was, you know, as are there kind of younger generations of civil, civil servants different from older generations? Um, 
and and might the civil service kind of change as uh, one generation of, of civil service retires and kind of others enter it. And I, you know, I think people have talked a lot about um, you know differences between generations and sort of young people are more tech savvy and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I have a slightly different perspective on the kind of some of the intergenerational uh, issues within the Ghana civil service, which is I don't think I don't think the younger generation is necessarily that intrinsically different. Um, but I do think that it's what's really important to recognize in any uh, in any system is the really important role that uh, is played by younger younger employees in the kind of overall performance of the organization. That is to say that even though they're kind of at lower levels, that's not to say that they're not incredibly important. Um, but also this kind of underappreciation that the experiences that people have uh, as young employees in organizations really powerfully shape their norms and how they inter they, uh, they grow in that organization or whether they even stay within it. Um, so, you know, within the civil service in Ghana, for example, you often find that uh, there are really, and this, this speaks a bit to the selection question that, you know, the civil service in Ghana gets a lot of really, really excellent young uh, talent entering. Um, some of those people, when they enter, get, uh, you know, bosses who challenge them and help them grow and give them meaningful work to do. And others of them get bosses who uh, see them as a threat or someone to kind of go do errands for them and don't take them seriously. Um, and then, you know, in those kind of situations, the people who can leave and the people who stay behind might be people who aren't that interested in doing meaningful work. Um, and so there's this, you know, again, this is something for the civil service, which is entirely free, which is to 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 use and challenge and help grow your uh, your younger staff, and that will stay with you. And I think that links as well um, to the research that Oriana talked about earlier, where, you know, um, the the work with nurses in Zambia, the really important thing there, it wasn't just the financial incentives; it was having a career path. This idea that you could progress and grow within an organization made such a big difference to people, even on top of like the, the money itself. Um, and so this is something that I wish that, you know, all civil services really paid uh, thought more explicitly about is how do we how do we so really support the development and engagement of this younger tier of people because they're going to help us a lot. Um, Thanks. Honey. Let me. Let me uh, do, do, was there anything else you wanted to say, Martin? Um, I can. I, I was just going to add, relating to Victor's question about mm. you know how it's kind of circulating brains in the economy, and um, you know I'm in the economy as a whole. I I, I don't really know. Um, within government, I think there's there's various means to do it, right? So, so governments use secondments and study visits and that kind of thing. Um, as a way to circulate people temporarily and hopefully bring back good ideas when they come. Um, one thing that actually came out of the uh, this the survey in Ghana that we were talking about was, you know, we did this initial survey working with Nana and the, the Office of Head of Civil Service, and we ha we had this these this set of findings, um, and I spoke about that finding that there are some really kind of well managed, high performing organizations and others that were much poor uh, much more poorly run. And so we said, one of Nana's ideas was, okay, a way to put these findings into action is let's organize study visits. Um, let's actually get the people from these poorly run organizations to go and spend some time with the, the um, high performing organizations and just see how things are different and see if they can learn practices that they can bring back into their organization. Um, and uh, you know, we, we then spent um, a few months kind of going back and forth working with OHCS and the Civil Service Training Center trying to figure out how how this could be, be actually implemented. And one of the things we realized was, okay, well, this is really hard to do at large scale because, um, you know, these, the kind of, uh, the high performing divisions, they still need to work. They can't just be hosting people for study visits all the time. Um, and so how do we do this on a large scale? And what we ended up doing was working with the Civil Service Training Center um, also funded by the IGC, and we uh, helped produce a video um, where uh, the people from these kind of well-managed organizations were interviewed about how they did things on a day-to-day -day basis. And that video then got in integrated into the training routine 
Um, so that was a way not of circulating brains, but circulating the ideas without, you know, being it without necessarily having to circulate the people themselves. I wonder, I'd, I'd uh, want to ask this of Nana, but let me ask it of you in, in um, his absence, particularly just building on, on your comments just now. I know that one of the things that emerged uh, as re in response to the research that we had carried out and the collaborations there was this training for productivity product project um, within the civil service. And I wonder if you could just briefly sketch what the key features of that were. Sure, Nana has just rejoined. Okay. Um, so maybe, Nana, did you hear that question? Uh, no, I, I've been, I, I, I was hearing, but I couldn't get in. I was frozen out. I've just been given a new link. Apologies. Okay. Well, it's great to have you back. So the question I was just posing is, we've been yeah. talking about how to improve productivity in the, in, in the civil service. And, and one of the questions asked was uh, about the circulation of brains and in the economy generally, but Martin was addressing that issue within the civil service. Um, and I just wondered if you could briefly summarize for us, Nana, uh, the key features of the Training for Productivity project that came out of the sort of research engagement you were talking about earlier. Uh, uh, um, thank you. The, the, the key, fe very, very interesting. Uh, let me say that I had a lot of the things that Martin said and I agree with him, so no need to go to. But the key features are that, you know, we already have a system where people are supposed to be assessed on a yearly basis, and they also be prepared for promotion. There was no linkage between the training directly, performance, and then this promotion business. So out of the research and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the work done between us and, 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 and Martin, we came clearly, the, what, the first element of that is that we attend those meetings no longer as individuals, but as a collective. So a directory to a unit will go together we agree the action plans together, and that is factored into your promotion. So it's now become an issue of assessment for both the, the, the staff and the, the managers or the supervisors. And at the, usually the promotion interviews, we want to find out whether you have achieved anything or not. And that has helped. We're still struggling, I must be honest, with getting this fully operational. There are a few challenges left and right. But the good thing about it is now being accepted as part of the normal training regime for the Civil Service Training Center, which is our training center which trains people below the director grade. So, so yes, that is in summary what is it? The people go together, they agree on action plan, they learn the theories and the concepts, and then they come back to the organization, they do it, and it's reflected during the promotion interview. So by, by doing that, you are not just promoting people out of for nothing but link to training and then link to work that they have done. And it's very much an embryonic concept, but I see it as something useful. Let me quickly, Jonathan, if you like, to, for me to address this bit about the generation uh, uh, issue, hmm. if, if it's okay, just two minutes. One of the outputs of our research was the need for us that in engaging staff, uh, particularly young men, young women, should have a different approach. So we started working with, with an American NGO, uh, Emerging Public Leaders uh, um, Scheme, whereby uh, smart guys from the universities uh, go through a rigorous process and they are, they are inter uh, interviewed, they go through the process, and then they are, they, are, they are put into the ministries and department. So far, we've done 60, and the result is amazing. For the first time, none of the people who did their national service were thrown out. All the uh, emerging leaders were accepted by the organizations. After the one year, the second year, they were recruited, went to the process, and all of them have been accepted. They started be, become examples. Indeed, for those years, we have, for, for the Ministry of Finance, all, only able to give them four people. They wanted 10 people to be posted to them. So that's one way of looking at it. We have not included financial resources financial remuneration as one of the considerations. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Hello. Sorry, go I ahead. We've not included financial remuneration as one of the programs. My reason was simple. I've gone through this process, and at least in Ghana, I've seen that financial remunerations do not necessarily lead to 
uh, productivity or increase pro uh, efficiency. We've seen that happens in a lot of these organizations would have been autonomous, but what we did was the people are giving more training, they are giving challenging responsibility. And as I said, we've we are on the 60th batch and they are performing excellent. So that has given me the incentive, the real thing that look, we can change our civil service. We can get the next generation of the civil without necessarily, I'm not saying financial resources are not important, resources are not important. But I'm saying if we have a system of training, a system of properly deploying them, and a system of uh, recognizing their role, we can have a new civil service. And hopefully, uh, we are able to sustain this over the coming year. We completely refuse the proposal by the American team that these people should be given extra remuneration. That was unacceptable to me. And it will, it will, it will be improving right over a three year period. These people are stellar, they are performing well. So that's the way I, I see uh, emerging uh, the new, uh, uh, dealing with the generational uh, challenges. Great, well, thanks very much. Now let me ask you another question that's been posed from, from the audience. And it's about the sustainability of everything you're doing after your, uh, after your departure. So Dr. Noreen, Kuchiwalia from IFPRI, formerly with the Ministry of Education in Ghana, uh, wanted to ask you the question, are there plans for new research projects once the training on research methods of further uh, civil servants has occurred, once the, tr the, the research method training has occurred? Um, you hope to retire soon, congratulations. Once you leave, how will the spirit of research-based policy within the civil service continue? And importantly, are there dedicated resources to support this? Um, thank you, uh, Jonathan, and thank you for the uh, question. Number one, uh, we, that's why we set up a oh, bureaucracy lab. Um, one of the outputs of our work was um, working with Martin and Imram and, 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 and Oko. We set up a bureaucracy lab in the office of the head of civil service, and we are working with ministries. We're getting it for me so that it becomes a basis for churning out a bit more research, but at the same time documenting the work that we have done. Number two, we have, um, as I said, put these research people that we train into various ministries. Number three, we have recruited two of those people into the, in, into the uh, uh, office of the head of SOSA, and they've been placed in a, a unit we call reform coordinating unit that is established under the law and hopefully that's what continue. The, the problem of sustainability, uh, uh, some of these things that they virtually now being mainstream. What we need now, what we are trying to do is get a lot more people on board to buy into it. Everything has been mainstream. It's now part of the uh, process. For instance, the training is part of the civil service training center curriculum. The performance management system is part of the work of the, uh, the career management directory in the office. Of, so. It's in a sense institutionalized and it's been accepted as part of the annual route. But the key thing is, I agree with you that you need somebody whoever comes. The, 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 the good thing is the head of state has no hand in appointing his successor. The bad thing is if you are not fortunate to, to get somebody who may be reform-minded, it can lead to a serious disaster. I've seen this happen the year 1997. Uh, we, we did a lot of good work then, uh, by 2013, 2003 or so, we had a complete change in leadership and that was very devastating for, for us. So I can understand that. That's why we've tried to institutionalize a lot of these things, put them into the system. So that's not dependent very much on a person, but it's a systemic thing. But I agree with you that leadership is also important in this. Great, thanks. Let me take um, uh, three more uh, questions and then uh, just have a chance for each of the three of you to comment on any of these uh, as we wrap up the discussion. So the first is from Jeffrey Mason, who's at the Charter Cities Institute in Washington, DC, and asks, to what extent can subnational demonstration effects inspire national level reforms? For example, suppose a charter city or a special economic zone in Zambia with significant autonomy creates a highly effective bureaucracy where public service delivery in that jurisdiction is highly regarded. What are the channels that such an example of reform can influence policy at the national level in Zambia or even just in Lusaka? 
So that's the first question about channels for uh, demonstration effects upwards from subnational reforms. The second from Benjamin Chibouye, a PhD candidate at the University of Kiel in Germany. During the current COVID-19 pandemic, the policy narrative and public discourse has emphasized greatly the use of hard or financial incentives to motivate healthcare providers. In what ways is the IGC bringing available evidence, emphasizing, for example, greater autonomy as being important, to bear on this conversation, this COVID conversation? And then finally, from Despuina de Linocula, a customs officer in Greece, do you think that the European Public Prosecutor Office, the EPPO, or other international institutions could actually act as a deterrent factor for corruption in the public sector. So um, let me actually, Orion, if you don't mind, let me start with you, particularly picking up that corruption uh, point, and then of course commenting on the hard incentives uh, uh, as well as you wish with the other questions. Uh, so I always find it kind of puzzling, the principle of having a monitor to monitor corruption activities, because the monitors are also people and they come from the same pool as this corrupt bureaucrats that they're supposed to be monitoring. So unless we think that there are a different type of person that is intrinsically more honest and the state is actually capable of spotting this intrinsically better person, adding a monitor on top of a bureaucrat can't do any good because at best he is as corrupt as and will take his share. At worst, he's more corrupt because he can control being above, can control a lot more. And so that will make things worse. It's only by chance that we will end up having somebody, the monitor being less corrupt than the person below. So it's just because they come from the same pool and they face similar incentives. It's not clear to me how that can ever be a solution. And the data show this, show that this is indeed the case. I think, you know, we keep repeating this, more autonomy is a better thing, not just because it spares us the cost of the monitor, but also because it motivates and it gives people a chance to do their job properly. So the answer is no, I don't think having a monitor will uh, give incentives to be less corrupt. And then there was the question on incentives for, uh, for civil servants. So we have to think of incentives, sorry, Jonathan. I didn't no, just saying in the COVID response in particular. In the saying. COVID response in particular. So we're asking a lot of frontline workers. Um, we have to distinguish two separate things when it comes to incentives. The word is used interchangeably to mean pay conditional on performance which is the economic word for incentives. And that's not so needed, I think, in this context. Also because, you know, um, measuring performance in the COVID response is not trivial. Uh, providing more funds for people who are working more seems not just efficient, it seems profoundly fair. So I think, I think it's important to remunerate the extra work that people are doing and the extra risks that they are taking. It is you know, a simple situation in which fairness and efficiency go hand in hand. Great, thanks Oriana. Uh, uh, Martin, I wonder if you want to comment on any of these. One we haven't touched on yet is the p potential for demonstration effects for subnational entities, but of course the autonomy issue was also raised. Sure. Um, well, I think on the autonomy issue, um, it's a, I think it's a really good point. And I think um, this, you know, the pandemic is kind of an extreme version of showing why it's really difficult to use performance incentives of the kind of linking pay to performance um, that Oriana talked about, why it's so hard to do that effectively in government, right? Because in order to incentivize something, you need to know in advance what it is that you want the person to do, right? So you have some kind of, usually most performance management systems have a kind of annual cycle where at the start of the year, um, whoever is the sort of 
you know, in charge, the finance ministry or the ministry of health, or sometimes a donor sets out a set of targets and says, you know, for different levels of performance against these targets, you will get rewarded or sanctioned in some way. Um, but the challenge is that, you know, government is so complex. There's so much coordination. There's so much uncertainty. Things change all the time. Um, it's almost impossible to envision in advance everything important that you might want a government organization to do. And when you set an, an incentive for a government to do, either for an organization or for an individual, when you give them an incentive to do one thing, you're implicitly incentivizing them not to do other things, like coordinate with each other or react to changing circumstances. And so, you know, again, that's one of the major limitations of incentive systems and linking performance to pay within the within governmental contexts. Um, and I think it's something where you know, obviously the benefit of autonomy is people really can adapt. There's also obvious costs and right. So people can misuse autonomy. Um, although empirically the research that we're doing, um, you know, Oriana, myself, other, other academics, like we're not finding actually as many examples of that being a, ma a major consideration as most people expect. Um, but it still is a consideration. And I think it's, um, it's, you know, it's work that we all need to do is to, sort of craft this different vision of what does autonomy mean, not just in the sense of civil servants uh, having legal protections from political, uh, their political masters, um, but also really like aut autonomy as a kind of active empowerment of uh, ensuring pe that people have the right information, creating the right kind of norms um, and, and setting up the right institutional framework for that. I think that's something we all need to re-envision. Okay, thanks very much, Martin. Um, Nana, we're just about out of time, and I wondered if you might just want to give a few summary thoughts uh, about the issues that we've been talking now before I bring things to a close. Oh, I uh, can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Hello. Yeah. Now I can hear you. Uh, on, 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 what I'm saying, on the films, yes, for our frontline workers, there was a system for, for paying them. So I think they had three months, uh, no taxes, and insurance scheme was, was introduced. And some received additional allowance, I think they're doing about 50% or so. But these are all short term things. I agree with Ariana completely about this monitor over the other stuff. I disagree with him uh, about the concept that everybody seemed to be uh, 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 corrupt. I think when people are given the autonomy, when people are properly not monitored, but when you have a measure, performance measure system, and when people are encouraged uh, through various means, more of any house thing, uh, to do things, to explore, to experiment, we are likely to see a bit more change. And I think consistency, uh, uh, consistency for me is great thing. Proactively, persistently uh, going on with, with reform, Forms, not a short term. That's why I have a problem with some of the uh, re uh, reforms that are introduced from outside. Um, two years project, three years project. For me, I think it's absolute nonsense and waste of everybody's resources. We should help organizations to work from inside, be data driven, and then let them evolve. They may make mistakes, they may not get there quickly, but that is much more sustainable than a lot of these because I've been through a lot of these. Britain Wood or whatever donor projects over many years. And that's why when I became head of this, I was convinced that that would not be the approach that would take. Our approach, I think, is much more sustainable. We've introduced a couple of things, which is giving a lot of people a bit more verb and they want to go out and see. And that's my take on this. Thanks. Great. Uh, no, no, thanks very much for that. So just uh, about out of time. Uh, let me just uh, summarize very briefly, really building on, on uh, Nana's comments. Now, I think what's come out very clearly for me from this discussion is one, that management matters uh, in the public sector. Two, there are concrete things that governments can do to improve uh, management and that then sees measurable uh, results, measurable improvements um, that are key to successful change 
is institutionalization. So not emphasize both institutionalizing uh, the, the sort of response to the research in the first instance, but also institutionalizing then the series of reforms uh, that carried out. I think as one of our, our questioners uh, queried, uh, we need to think from the beginning about sustainability of reforms. And, and I think a lot of the measures that have been talked about in the Ghanaian context directly address that. There are challenges, and I think per perhaps notably, uh, as Nana mentioned, the challenge of managing the, the political administrative interface, managing the vectoral cycle and how to prevent that and the inevitable sort of new initiatives and disruptions that happen from undermining progress in the public sector. Um, but I think fundamentally the message is, is a very optimistic one that we do ha now know a lot more about how to improve the performance of the civil service. Um, there's uh, concrete actions that governments around the world can take uh, to do that uh, and that uh, COVID has highlighted just how important uh, this is. So let me just thank uh, a huge thank you to the participants uh, for a really uh, stimulating and insightful conversation uh, and then uh, thank you to all of the uh, participants uh, who have joined us as well. As I said uh, this will all be on, available online so do feel free to access that uh, afterwards but thank you all very much.